Egyptian civilization was, to the ancient Greeks, kind of like what the Greeks are to us. A grand, intimidating civilization that rose and fell and invented stuff in the distant past, all while our ancestors were herding sheep. Anyway, it seems the Greeks also believed the Egyptians had a little help from supernatural sources. This is more or less equivalent to believing that aliens built the pyramids. This is Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. Welcome to Open Book, Episode 2, How to Read Plato's Phaedrus. I'm Michael Elliott, Associate Professor of English at the University of Calgary, and today's topic is written language, as the Greek philosopher Plato describes it in his dialogue Phaedrus, namely as a blessing and a curse. I recognize that it's counterintuitive to make a books podcast about the demerits of books, but I suspect by the end you'll see why. There are two sections of this episode. In the first, I'll introduce the tense relationship of written and spoken words. And in the second, I'll describe the two issues that Plato's dialogue has with written language. There's a Latin proverb, verba volant scripta manent, that means spoken words fly away, written words remain. It sums up the virtue of written language according to ancient writers. Unlike the words we say aloud, written words persist. They can be stored, shared, engraved, translated, interpreted, and misinterpreted for as long as, quote, men can breathe or eyes can see, as Shakespeare put it in Sonnet 18. Writing enables all sorts of things to be recorded from our deepest desires to our bank balance. So you'd think that the invention of writing would be greeted with the same enthusiasm as the discovery of fire or the invention of later conveniences and pleasures. The internal combustion engine, say, or the pain au chocolat. But like those inventions, writing is a mixed blessing. Sure, it's a cure for memory loss, No need to remember how to find the good hunting grounds when you have these handy written directions. And the stories of our ancestors needn't rely on the faltering memories of our elders. But writing has been called a pharmakon, a Greek word that translates both as a cure and a poison. It's either the cure for memory loss or the cause of memory loss. No need to memorize telephone numbers when your phone stores them for you, or basic facts that used to be called general knowledge, like the name of the UN Secretary General, or your seven times tables. This subject arises at the end of Plato's dialogue Phaedrus, a philosophical conversation between Plato's teacher Socrates, and an Athenian named Phaedrus. Most of their conversation is about love, the internal conflict between our loves of pleasure and of virtue, illustrated in an allegory, or extended metaphor, of the lover driving a chariot drawn by two horses that represent this conflict. Digression I say conversation, but really, Socratic dialogues feel quite one-sided. Typically, Socrates listens for a while to some interlocutor making untenable claims. Uh, For example, in the Republic, someone claims that justice should mean whatever the most powerful person wants it to mean. Socrates then asks some probing questions that often lead the other person towards some extraordinary conclusions, and then he takes over systematically dismantling their position and constructing one of his own on more defensible principles. In response to his devastatingly rational speeches, Socrates' poor interlocutor is typically reduced to saying things like, Most true, Socrates, or Do expound further, Socrates, and Thank you, Socrates, may I have another? 
All right, so I made up the last one. End digression. So, toward the end of this conversation, Socrates goes meta. He and Phaedrus have been talking about the relative merits of speeches that are written down or recited aloud, when he tells the story of an ancient Egyptian king named Thamus, who receives gifts from a god named Theuth. Egyptian civilization was, to the ancient Greeks, kind of like what the Greeks are to us. A grand, intimidating civilization that rose and fell and invented stuff in the distant past, all while our ancestors were herding sheep. Anyway, it seems the Greeks also believed the Egyptians had a little help from supernatural sources. This is more or less equivalent to believing that aliens built the pyramids. The god Theuth gives the Egyptians, quote, arithmetic and calculation and geometry and astronomy and drafts, aka checkers, and dice, all quite useful arts and entertainments, but his most valuable gift is a system of writing to record speech before it disappears in a set of markings on papyrus. By the way, in my translation, Plato calls this system, quote, the use of letters, but he probably means letters in the generic non-alphabetical sense because the Egyptians used a pictorial script. Anyway, King Thamus is grateful enough for these gifts, but not categorically. As Socrates says, quote, Thamus inquired about their several uses and praised some of them and censured others as he approved or disapproved of them. There are two disadvantages to writing over speaking. The first is that writing merely offloads knowledge from the mind to the papyrus, as Thamus recognizes, when Theuth boasts that letters would give Egyptians better memories. Thamus demurs, quote, the parent or inventor of an art, he says, is not always the best judge of the utility or inutility of his own inventions. He elaborates at more length, quote, for this discovery of yours will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls because they will not use their memories. They will trust to the external written characters and not remember of themselves. Writing is an aid not to memory, but to reminiscence. And you give your disciples not truth, but only the semblance of truth. They will be hearers of many things and will have learned nothing. They will appear to be omniscient and will generally know nothing. They will be tiresome company, having the show of wisdom without the reality. Books, for example, are external containers of truth and wisdom. But to be wise, you need to internalize them. The second disadvantage to writing over speaking falls to Socrates himself to recognize, as you'd expect, because he performed philosophy only in oral dialogue, relying on students like Plato to transcribe them into letters. He says that you internalize wisdom only by interrogating it. Quote, I cannot help feeling, Phaedrus, that writing is unfortunately like painting, for the creations of the painter have the attitude of life, and yet if you ask them a question, they preserve a solemn silence. And the same may be said of speeches. You would imagine that they had intelligence, but if you want to know anything and put a question to one of them, the speaker always gives one unvarying answer. That answer is always the same. Read the text. A book can't elaborate or qualify or apply its ideas outside the bounds of its written text. It lacks the dynamic wisdom of spoken discourse, which Socrates and Phaedrus describe as, quote, an intelligent word graven in the soul of the learner and the, the living word of knowledge of which the written word is properly no more than an image. Discourse is wisdom because wisdom must be alive, must be fluid and supple enough to provoke understanding in others. 
I'm tempted to suggest in conclusion that writing is to discourse what literary texts can be to literary criticism. Texts are preserved silent images of speech, like museum pieces or mosquitoes trapped in amber, critical inquiries, expositions, investigations, even recitations or, or silent readings, all of these enliven and invigorate the speech that lies dormant in texts. Closing digression on the mosquitoes in amber. I owe that comparison to Michael Crichton's novel Jurassic Park, later a blockbuster film series about rampaging genetically engineered dinosaurs, but I also owe it to the static given off by rubbing amber. In Greek, electron, the root word for electricity. From there, it was a short leap to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, a novel about a 19th century scientist using electricity to give life to a monstrous inanimate corpse. So if you read books through the lenses of other books, you can make the most outlandish and illustrative metaphors. End digression. Plato's Phaedrus teaches us not to venerate books and the writing in them, but to venerate discourse, our critical conversations about them. Venerating books is the error people make when they visit someone's well-stocked library. Oh, you must be so well-read, they often say. Not necessarily, the owner should reply. I'm just well-shelved. John Milton memorably described a good book Quote, as the precious lifeblood of a master spirit, embalmed and treasured up on purpose to a life beyond life. Reading and discussing and understanding is that life beyond life. You've been listening to Open Book, a podcast about interpreting literature, with Michael Elliott. The next episode is on book one of Milton's Paradise Lost, which thrusts us into the disorienting middle of a familiar story, the Christian myth of the world's creation and humanity's exile from paradise. Meanwhile, you can search me up in the usual places. It should turn up my blog if you spell my surname U-L-L-Y-O-T, or go straight there by typing j.mp slash U-L-L-Y-O-T. On the social networks, you can find me on Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter in descending order of regularity. And then there's old-fashioned email, U-L-L-Y-O-T at ucalgary.ca. That's U-C-A-L-G-A-R-Y dot C-A. The music from this episode is courtesy of the Open Well-Tempered Clavier Project and performed by Kimiko Ishizaka. Today's selections from Plato's Phaedrus were from Benjamin Jowett's 1892 translation as cited in the anthology Critical Theory Since Plato, 3rd edition, 2005, edited by Hazard Adams and Leroy Searle.